as well. Good morning to all those in uh, Facebook land who are joining us today for our morning worship service and to all of uh, our uh, congregants here on the Zoom call as well. Uh, we're thankful unto the Lord for bringing us to a, another day and another opportunity for us to gather together. Um, it has um, been, uh, you know, a, a week that has seemed like a year, <laughs> um, but uh, through it all, God has been faithful and his goodness and his mercy um, uh, continues to remain. And uh, the, song, the song that I played this morning is by uh, Jonathan McReynolds. Uh, entitled Not Lucky But Loved, and um, I love the bridge of a, a very familiar song that uh, if you grew up in church and maybe in um, in children's church you sang it, Yes, Jesus Loves Me, but um, that is a truth that uh, no matter how old we are, um, it is a wonderful truth um, that we can reflect upon as we give thanks to God today um, for all of his goodness. Um, so as we um, get started today, the word of God um, tells us uh, to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And so uh, just before um, we uh, get started with the service today, um, I just want with hearts of gratitude, if maybe we can just take a moment and just take 30 seconds just to worship God and to give thanks for all that he has done and for all that he has blessed us with. So will you join me this morning and just give thanks mm -hmm. to God. Father, we thank you. We thank bless you. you. We Jesus. honor you. Lord, you're worthy to be praised, yes, oh God. Yes. Lord, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, Lord, we are thankful, Lord, this morning and thankful that you have, uh, Lord, given us another day that yes. we might declare yes. your goodness and your mercy in the yes. land of the living. Yes, Lord, thank you, oh God, Lord, for your wondrous works, your wondrous deeds. Lord, for giving us life and health and breath, for allowing us to experience the beauty of your creation. Lord, thank you for the flowers that are blooming. Thank you yes, for the, the yes. sun that is staying up longer. Lord, thank you for, Lord, all the changes that we see in the ecosystem, reminding us of the faithfulness of your character and your nature, and reminding us that the God who sees us, Lord, is concerned about every aspect of our lives and our existence. Yes. Father, as we come together this morning, morning. May our hearts be filled with gratitude. May yes, our hearts God. be filled with worship. Lord, may we be reminded that your love is immense towards us, O oh God. Mm -hmm. May we be reminded that what shall separate us from the love of Christ, neither height nor depth nor things present nor things to come nor angels nor demons, no, by no means, none of these things shall separate us from the immense love that is found in Christ Jesus. So as we gather together this morning, as we worship your holy name, as we bless your name, O oh God, Lord, be glorified yes, in our midst. Lord. We ask that you'll be glorified in our worship, be glorified in our sharing, be glorified, Lord, in our conversation, be glorified in our proclamation of the word, Lord. In everything that we do today, we want you, O oh Lord, to be glorified. Mm -hmm. O oh Lord, I pray right now, even for those who are coming into today's service with a heavy heart, and with burdens on their heart. Father, we thank you, Lord, that at the altar of your presence, Lord, we can make the great exchange, laying down our burdens, laying down our frustrations, laying down our, our cares, Lord. For you said, cast our cares upon you, for you careth for us. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, as we bring our cares and our petitions, Lord, we lay them down even right now. Uh, some of us are tired. We've gone through um, challenges this week. Some of us have had exhausting work schedules. Some of us have been uh, uh, stressed by the events of life. Uh, some of us are just trying to manage to get by. Uh, some of us have struggled um, without the normal financial and other economic um, means that we would normally have in this season. And so, Father, in the midst of all these things, you know where each and every one of us is at. You know our station. You know the condition of our heart. And we pray that you will continue to lift us up in Christ Jesus' name. And so, Father, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Um, well, as we give thanks today, um, is there anything uh, I just wanted to open up as, as we start today's service? Uh, anybody thankful for anything uh, this morning that they'd love to share? Uh, with us as we gather together this morning. Anything that you're, you're thankful for? I'm just thankful for our community. Mm. Um, 
it's meant a lot to get you through this season mm, of totally. quarantine and, and isolation. Mm -hmm. I'm really just thankful for all you guys. Yes, yes. No, what an amazing uh, uh, group of people and uh, people who love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and are striving to love their neighbors as themselves. And so we thank God uh, for that. Amen. Anyone else? Doesn't have to be super deep. It can be uh, <laughs> anything. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not. <laughs> Started off on a very deep note. <laughs> hmm. I'm thankful that um, there's the ability to still have hope. That's also fairly deep, I know. But <laughs> I'm, I'm just thankful for it. Thankful that our kids have only one more week of school. Yes, man. <laughs> Thankful this is the last week of school. Praise <laughs> Jesus. I'm, I'm now wishing I could send our kids uh, to Ghana for the summer. <laughs> um, you know, I, I never, growing up in Michigan, a lot of my friends would, um, their parents would send them down south. And I was like, oh, man. And uh, now I see why. <laughs> um, um, but uh, thankful that uh, um, they've made it through another school year. I'm also thankful, um, one of my, I think I've shared this in morning prayer, um, one of the joys I've found in this season is um, by cooking uh, some new recipes. And so um, over the last couple of weeks, I've had tried a whole lot of uh, new dishes and um I think it's exciting, you know, when you try something new and it actually comes out good and, and is really tasty. I think I get very frustrated when I put a lot of effort into something and then it comes out and it's just horrible. But that's also part of the learning process to take the wins with the losses. And um, But I'm thankful for that joy that that brings just to uh, uh, be in the kitchen and, uh, and try new things. So. thankful that my parents are healthy and doing well mm -hmm. and you know, my immediate family's healthy no one's been um, infected with the virus mm -hmm. everyone's staying in place and you know there's people around us have been affected and I'm just grateful that my my 80 year old parents and folks are, are, are doing well yeah. oh yeah we still have a virus going on I forgot about that right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly Anyone else before we gather today? All right, well, praise God. Well, um, as we gather together, as is our custom, uh, we want to uh, begin with uh, joining together in worship and singing together unto the Lord. Um, and each week as we um, come uh, together, um, we, we choose a song that helps us to kind of center our hearts and center our minds uh, upon uh, the work of Jesus Christ and uh, upon what he's doing in each and every one of our lives. And so um, as we join together, I'm going to uh, mute you all, but feel free to sing out loudly and let all of your neighbors hear you. And um, as we join together, um, we will sing unto the Lord and um, uh, uh, give glory unto his name. So for those of you who are... Um, uh, with us on uh, Zoom. You can see the words on the screen. For those of you who are um, uh, with us on Facebook Live, feel free to uh, look up the words of this week's song. And so let me share my screen and uh, we will join together. Lord, everybody. Um, it's so good to know that where uh, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And thankful is also that we know that God, our God is ever present and he is with us. Um, and even as there's so much going on that's affecting all of us in various ways, um, at the end of it all, my prayer is that Jesus is the center of everything that we do. Um, even as we're, uh, some of us are, are protesting and 
doing things um, to kind of educate ourselves as well as others on the events of the day, Jesus still can be the center. And so that is my prayer. So if you will join as we sing together. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you, Jesus. You. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do, Jesus, you're the From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we are asking of you that in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we learn, that your son would be the center of it all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. 
Jesus at the center of it all. Um, you know, isn't that the cry of our hearts, um, that even in the midst of everything that is going on right now, uh, that Jesus would be the center of uh, our hearts, Jesus would be the center of our church, Jesus would be the center of every single thing that we're doing, and that as he remains at the center, it allows us to be able to hear from God and say, Lord, uh, like Jehoshaphat said, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? What are you calling me to do? What, how are you calling us to respond? How are you calling us to move forward? How are you calling us to be your ambassadors in the earth? And so um, let's continue to keep Jesus at the center of everything that we do. I know there are many natural solutions that we're looking for. There are many natural things that we need answers to. Um, uh, Jesus is a healer, but I still believe in getting a vaccine. So I'm praying for our scientists. I'm praying... Um, you know, same way that you, you know, Jesus is a way maker, but you still go to your job nine to five and well, maybe eight to four or eight to seven or whatever your hours are. Um, so we, we see both the natural and the spiritual, uh, that the Lord has called us to. Amen. 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 Um, this morning we're going to be joining together, uh, in communion at the end of today's service. And so if you don't have any elements, um, you can find some water or juice, uh, some type of uh, juice or crackers, uh, excuse me, some type of juice or um, water. And then um, if you have a cracker or bread, huh? Oh, or wine, um, <laughs> you, if you have a cracker or um, uh, some type of bread, um, these uh, elements uh, represent the body and the blood uh, that was shed for us. And as we remember that this morning on Communion Sunday, we'll partake together. Uh, at the end of our service today. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a heads up so you can kind of sneak out if you need to to, uh, to grab those elements. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm excited about um, today's um, study. We are uh, continuing in our study of the book of First Samuel. Um, remember, we journeyed through the beginning of First Samuel where um, we recognize um, the Lord's calling upon Samuel, and Samuel is juxtaposed against Eli, who was the great high priest. And we remember Hannah and Penina. Um, Hannah was barren and cried out to the Lord um, for a child. And and remember that in the in that midst in that moment, we learn from that the importance of crying out to the Lord, meaning that. Um, you know, when things are difficult or thing, we don't always understand things, um, the Lord hears our cries and is responsive to our cries. And aren't you thankful that the Lord um, yeah. hears, hears our cries? Yeah. Um, you know, I've realized as a parent, um, you know, you, you, you gain this wonderful attribute, and I think it's a necessary attribute, is that as a parent, you learn how to tune out crying children um you know and at a certain point you know it will be at certain places and and the kids are like screaming and i'm just like eating my ice cream and i'm like oh okay you know like you know it's just like you tune them out and what meanwhile all the rest of the parents are like don't you hear your kid crying and i'm like oh no not really um um but <laughs> the realization that god does not tune us out he um hears our cries and uh, the Bible says that if we ask anything in accordance with his will, that he hears us. And that if he hears us, we have that which we've asked of him. And so um, as we journey through these last couple of weeks, we, we've seen a number of parallels in how uh, God dealt with uh, uh, Israel and um, their journey um, of faith um, uh, through the last judge of Samuel. Um, and in the last couple of weeks, we dealt with the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was the natural representation of where God uh, lived. And so in the Ark of the Covenant, um, uh, 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 the elements represented the presence of God. Um, and, and later on, which would be the, the holies of holies and other uh, uh, places that the, the temple that uh, would, would, would represent God's uh, holy place. But what we see and what we recognize is that um, the people of God took the symbol of God as the presence of God. And so while the symbol and, and the relics that we have that represent God um, are, are good reminders of God's presence, they never replace God's presence. Mm -hmm. And we should never um, think in our minds that just because the physical element is present with us, 
that it allows us uh, God's um, presence to be with us. And so uh, Brother David reminded us, um, uh, remember when um, uh, Moses was, uh, was it Moses, um, before, the, um, before the bush and he asked them, uh, you know, whose side are you on? Um, you know, our side or their side? And, and the, the, the soldier says, neither side. Um, I'm on the Lord's side. And so recognize that in the midst of this, um, you know, I, I've been working on a document that I'll be sharing with uh, our congregation and others um, about how to, how to walk with um, our black, brown, black and brown brothers and sisters in Christ through this season. Um, you know, I found a lot of people have a lot of different, you know, thoughts of, you know, what, what to do or how to do it. Um, but, um, it's just 21 short little thoughts of, um, what that looks like. And, and one of those, um, you know, one of those, uh, aspects is to recognize that, um, there's the temptation always to frame this as left or right. Mm. Um, so the issues that are going on, it's a left side issue or a right side issue. And then we tend to um, relegate ourselves to the, the core positions and the talking points of those um, two different sides. But what if we reframe this? Um, uh, uh, some of you know rapper KB. Um, he said, uh, you can tell you've made an idol out of your politics when you see it as a left versus right issue rather than a kingdom of God versus kingdom of darkness issue. And so um, that's one of the thoughts that I shared. Um, and, and again, I'll be sharing that uh, online a little bit later today. Um, but the reminder that, um, you know, we're working for a kingdom of God agenda. Um, we're not working for a Republican, Democrat, independent, or any agenda. We're working for a kingdom of God agenda. You may happen to be Republican or Democrat or independent, and you're free to be any one of those and still in the body of Christ. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. Uh, we can all have our political ideologies, but at the core of it, what brings us together is that we are ultimately fighting for our first and primary identity, which is that we are children in the kingdom of God, and we are fighting to advance God's kingdom. Remember what uh, Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. We are praying God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we may debate vigorously what the best way to accomplish that is. We may debate vigorously what policies and, and principles um, uh, you know, we enact to do that. But we can't debate what principles are core to the heart of God. He's called us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he's called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah. And any policy, law, procedure that violates those two commands is not part of the kingdom of God. It's part of the kingdom of darkness. Now, apply that standard any way you will, but that's the standard I use to be able to determine how do I know? Should I be for this or against this? I ask the question, does it elevate the two key um, uh, laws that the Lord instructed us to do, or does it violate them? And again, it's not always an easy call, but in that, it helps me to be able to discern between what I should be fighting for and what I should be fighting against. And so, amen? Amen. amen. Um, so let me share with you um, today's um, lesson. For those of you who are on Facebook with us today, uh, you can uh, uh, go to the Barnes Hill Fellowship um, uh, fan page, and you'll be able to uh, download a copy of today's message, or if you're a friend with me on Facebook, you can also see a link to uh, the notes for today's session on there as well, and I will uh, go ahead and share the notes um, with uh, those of you who are on our Zoom call today. Uh, so last week we began, um, uh, again, uh, reading in chapter number seven. I'm just going to spend a short, brief amount of time uh, dealing with the latter part of chapter number seven um, and what happens after a national re uh, revival, a national repentance movement moves, um, uh, happens in Israel. Um, we begin to see what happens there. And then between chapter number seven and chapter number eight, um, there's about a 40 year gap. Um, and so we see chapter number seven is going to end with Samuel judging uh, Israel. And you see, um, you know, Samuel and all of his righteousness. And then the, the writer fast forwards 
about 40 years. Um, uh, some commentators believe Samuel was about 60 to 75 or 80 years old uh, at this time. And what we'll begin to see is that, unfortunately, uh, Samuel goes in the way of his predecessor, Eli. And uh, uh, because of nepotism, um, uh, his sons uh, get a place as judges in Israel. And out of that, they also uh, begin to uh, corrupt um, uh, the ways and the, and the things of God. And we'll see how corruption bursts the people asking for a king. And so uh, let's pray as we receive the word of God together this morning. Father, thank you so much for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, we're thankful that we can gather together this morning and come to you. And Father, we thank you. Uh, for this short time that we have together to worship, to explore your wonderful word. We pray that we might learn, we might grow, we might be built up in our most holy faith as we study your word this morning. We pray for all those who are joining us together on Facebook Live, on Zoom, and those who live and desire to be here today but were not able to be. Lord, bless us in our time of gathering. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Um, so... Uh, Remember that um, in chapter number seven, the beginning of chapter number seven, um, uh, um, Samuel tells the people that if you really want to return to the God, return to God wholeheartedly, this is what you must do. You must get rid of your idols. So he told them, look, get rid of your Asherah and, and Baal uh, um, uh, um, and these idols that were commonplace um, in the land. Repent. And turn away from your sin. And so, um, and uh, as they're in the midst of saying, we will do that and we will respond to that, we see at the beginning of chapter number seven, it says, Samuel says, assemble all at Mitzvah and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mitzvah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted and they confessed, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel was leader of Israel at Mitzvah. Um, so what you see here is, um, there are many reasons for fasting. One of the reasons you see here for fasting is turning the hearts of the people back to God. Um, you know, fasting can be used to hear from God when we're in a time or a season where we're inquiring of the Lord. But fasting is also a sign of surrender to be able to say, Lord, um, we have sinned against you. So not only did they turn away from their sin, not only did they confess their sin, but they also fasted to say, Lord, we renew our vow that you are the one who sustains us. Um, and, um, you know, uh, fasting as a practice, um, there are other religions that fast um, quite often. I think, you know, one of the, the challenges is that um, um, Christians probably don't fast enough. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I say that Christians don't fast enough is because um, if you are honest and an honest Christian, you will realize that the flesh is strong. Um, though we might be in Christ, the flesh roars its evil head. And what fasting also does is puts the flesh in check. Um, and one of the victories that you get out of fasting is the confidence in knowing that what the flesh is screaming and yelling about, you don't have to give into. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you um, understand this, but like the flesh talks. I mean, the flesh will always flare up, but just because the flesh is speaking doesn't mean you have to respond to it. I remember um, there was a season when I was uh, at law school and um, it was at the Park Suffolk University Law School and, and uh, we were at Park Street Station. And any of you know Park Street Station, you come right out of Park Street Station and right out of Park Street Station, there is a Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and so, you know, it would be, I mean, I would have a whole 30 minute train ride and on the train ride, I would tell myself, I'm not getting a donut. I'm not getting a donut. And as soon as I came out of the train station, somehow the flesh talked me into walking in and getting my chocolate donut. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't till uh, a season of fasting where, yes, it was a fight. Yes, it was a wrestle. But I was reminded that just because the flesh roars, its voice and its head doesn't mean that I have to give into it. So the people fasted. And um, what's interesting is that we begin to see in the next section is that um, as they're fasting, 
the Philistines hear what is happening and begin to get afraid. And so what do we see here um, in the text? And it says, I said, no, no, no good deed goes unpunished. While Israel was in the midst of a natural national repentance, the Philistines come attacking. So uh, another principle that you'll see here is without a doubt, when you are trying to do spiritual things, you will generally fall under attack. When you're trying to fast, everyone will want to cook for you and drop off cookies at your house. When you are trying to, you know, let's say you're trying to cut down on alcohol consumption. That's when everyone wants to invite you out to happy hour. And I mean, there's all, you know, whatever, whenever you are trying to press forward, there will always be forces that are trying to push you back um, and try and cause you to lose sight of the progress that you're making in Christ Jesus. And so verse seven through nine has an interesting turn of events. So God is bringing revival to the Israelites. We see they're repenting, they're turning away from their sin, they're getting rid of their idols. The, the revival is breaking out in the land. And this is what we prayed for uh, for America. Lord, bring revival out to land. But one of the things that happened is that in the midst of revival, they're still scarred by their past. Let me, let me emphasize this for you. It is possible that God is doing a mighty work but your past still keeps you bound in the flesh rather than being released in what God wants to do. Remember what happened with Elijah, um, just real quickly. Um, Elijah, he goes out and he, you know, he, he, uh, he, he has the bottle, the, excuse me, the battle uh, with all of the, um, uh, 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 the prophets and he, he, he declares before the prophets, look, if God be God, um, you know, let him be God. If your gods be God, let them be God. And, and they have the, they have the, 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 the fight of the prophets and the fight of the gods and, and God shows up mightily. God shows up strong. But immediately after that, Jezebel says, let me find that little rascal. And so she goes out to seek for Elijah. And so in the midst of revival, the enemy strikes up. And this is a common tactic that the enemy has. Look, we need to be aware and on guard because in the midst of what God is doing in this season, the enemy will try and rear his ugly head, trying to cause confusion and doubt. And so what happened? The moment that the Israelites heard that the Philistines were around, they were overcome with fear. I mean, can you imagine that? So God is moving mightily in their land. God is showing up strong. God tells them to repent. They're repenting. They're thanking God. They're, they're, we're wonderful. But then is the Philistines hear what's going on in Israel and they're like, we're going to attack. And as soon as the, the Israelites hear that, what do they do? They're overcome with fear. And they say, oh, no, I don't know how we're going to survive this. I don't know how we're going to make it. And they cried out to Samuel, don't stop crying out to the Lord God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel does what Samuel knows to do. He uh, gets a sacrifice and he offers it on the Lord. Um, but what is beautiful about this story, and, and this is another element that we're learning about God, is the Lord's answer was not the traditional way of deliverance that they would have imagined. And this is one thing that I always tell people, that when you're praying to God, You've got to give room, like while you can ask for God to do something, you've got to give room for God to do what only he could do. And so I don't think they could have imagined what God was going to do in this situation. And so that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. Uh, the men of Israel rushed out uh, of Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to the point below Beth Car. So what, what am I saying? God can bring his deliverance any way he chooses. If you are open to God's deliverance, you'll see his hand of deliverance. But you've got to be open to what God is doing and watch him work. Amen? Amen. Um. After the victory, Samuel made sure that a spiritual marker of victory uh, was provided for the Lord in that season. He took a stone at Mitzvah and named it the stone Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. So that's the ending of um, chapter number seven. Uh, you know, the other point I wanted to make about chapter number seven is not only did Ebenezer mark a great victory, 
But the Lord said that while Samuel was still judge, they never had a problem anymore with the Philistines. Now, there will be later seasons where um, uh, Israel has to deal with the Philistines, um, but they experienced a period of peace with their greatest adversary and their greatest enemy. And it was because the people turned back to God and turned their hearts back to God. Any questions or comments before we move to chapter number eight? Um, so as I mentioned, there's about a 40 year span between, uh, chapter number seven and chapter number eight and chapter seven ends with this beautiful picture of, uh, the faithfulness of Samuel and, and it's, it's juxtaposed against the unfaithfulness of Eli in his, in his, in his old age, but we see this abrupt turn. And so while Samuel was doing what was right in the Lord's eyes, um, he fell to the same challenges that Eli fell to. And the uh, uh, Bible says in verse number one in chapter number eight, excuse me, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. His sons, Joel, which means the Lord is God, and Abijah, which means Jah is the Lord or my divine father is the Lord, served at a local town, maybe about 50 miles away from Ramah. So the equivalent would be that, um, you know, Samuel was still, you know, at the governor's mansion in Beacon Hill in Massachusetts, but he sent his sons um, to Springfield, Massachusetts to be judges there. That's that's kind of um, the, well, it was 50 miles, uh, Springfield's a little more than 50 miles from Boston, but uh, you kind of get the gist that um, he appoints, I mean, the difference probably between Eli and Samuel is that um, uh, his sons, uh, Samuel's sons are appointed in a smaller town and likely, um, what was happening was that, um, 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 likely what was happening was that, um, uh, maybe he was training up his kids, um, to, um, be able to eventually take over, um, the spiritual judgeship, uh, responsibility. And, but what happened was that even though they were local judges, they seem to be a part of the changing culture of spiritual judges. And so um, they reintroduced into the, the judge culture um, just this lack of credibility and justice. And so the first red flag that we see was the blind nepotism, which was the same detestable practice of Eli that caused Israel to spiral into spiritual and moral decline. You remember uh, e, uh, Eli's two sons, you remember uh, what the word of God said about them? Uh, they were wicked. Um, he says that they were wicked and um, you would think Samuel would have learned his lesson. This is also a point of why we need to study history and know history. Now, it's not even like Samuel had to read about this history. Samuel lived through this history and yet and still he repeated some of the same mistakes. And so uh, verse 2 says Samuel's sons did not walk in his ways they turned aside for dishonest gain and acceptable bribes and perverted justice. Um, why do you think this was such an affront to God? Well, God's had an issue with his people has always been the work of justice. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, one of the things that should concern us most about the current climate that we find ourselves in is that uh, is it, as abhorrent as injustice it is, it's even worse if it's based on something as arbitrary as a person's skin color or national mm -hmm. or national mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So we begin to see that there are things that are core to the heart of God that um, when these were people um, who were judges, um, who had a responsibility to judge fairly and to judge righteously, and uh, they were making arbitrary decisions um, based upon their preferences. What else? Why? Why else was this abhorrent to God? Well, I guess I feel like this is a theme that people are corrected on a lot in the Bible. Um, my m my Bible on my phone has a lot of links to. Um, uh, 
Deuteronomy and Exodus and the law saying not to take bribes because they pervert justice. But we see the same thing in the epistles where they say in um, in the celebration of the Eucharist not to show partiality. Yeah. Both. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so there, there, there's an aspect that God specifically gave instructions. Like this is important to God because he specifically said, don't do it. I mean, like... Yeah. You know, some of the things that like, I mean, I agree. There are some things where, um, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us about social media. So if you have a Facebook account, you know, there are some people who say Facebook is of the devil, just like the TV was of the devil. I, I, I'm not one of those. And if that's the way you feel, that's fine. I mean, you can debate that vigorously. But things that God explicitly said, there's no debating. Like if God says, don't take bribes, don't pervert justice, don't. Um, so uh, partiality, then those are not like maybe, those are not like optional considerations. Those are firm instructions that he gave us um, and commandments. And so when we don't follow those, we are disobeying God's commandments. Anything else anybody can think of, of why God, um, uh, why God was, uh, uh, God um, was frustrated and, and why this dishonored God so much? Well, the prophets are God's representatives on earth. Yeah. And if God's representatives on earth are dishonest, then the implication is that God is dishonest. Amen. Yeah. And and that, just, of course, destroys the spirituality, the faith of the people. And it may well be a contributing factor to why they demanded a king later on. Yes, absolutely. You, you hit the nail on the head. Exactly what I was thinking is that the Bible teaches us that there are certain responsibilities that he gives to people and 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 offices in in the church or 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 responsibilities and and in the old testament there were certain positions and offices and and as brother david said the general categorization was that these are god's representatives on the earth and um you know in in the new testament there are uh, they call them the pastoral epistles and so first and second timothy titus um, these pastoral epistles um, talk about what are the qualifications for pastors, bishops, elders, leaders. And, and so it gives leadership qualifications. Why are there leadership qualifications? Because in the natural system and natural order, someone who sits in a place of responsibility represents the person that they are entrusted, who entrust them with that, with that responsibility. And so the Bible says it's required of stewards to be found faithful. And so, um, I mean, nothing abhors um, someone more than someone representing you going out and making a fool um, of you before other people. Now, um, I grew up in one of those households where, you know, mom used to say, you know, you are an Ardafio. Don't go out there and embarrass me. Don't go out there and, you know, make a fool or a mockery of me. And and uh, happy birthday to mom. Um, she might be watching the, the preview in Ghana. So happy birthday to mom uh, today. Um, but um, uh, um, thank God for that lesson that she taught me because I always thought about the fact that when I'm going out somewhere, I am representing more than just myself. Some of us have never thought about that, but that was ingrained in me from a young age that wherever I go, I am representing more than myself. Now, I realize that I wear multiple identities. So I'm representing myself. I'm representing Mars Hill Fellowship Church. I'm representing the company that I work for. I'm representing, um, you know, uh, 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 what black fathers and uh, uh, look like. I'm, I'm representing a number of different identities. And I realize, again, I will not be perfect and I don't claim to be perfect, but I do realize that I don't want to knowingly bring the gospel into disrepute because of my actions and my behavior. Um, there are plenty of things that I create drafts on social media and delete because I realize that this is not going to be a good witness to the identities that I hold. Now, again, I'm not trying to be fake. I try to be as authentic as possible, but I also realize that some things that I want to say are not going to be helpful. Some things that I want to say will not build up the body of Christ. They'll make me feel good in the moment and feel like I scored on somebody and dunked on them, but it won't help the body of Christ be built up. 
And so um, there are specific commands. And as um, Grace alluded to, um, there's a couple of instructions in Deuteronomy that just so poignantly kind of captures the heart of God for this. And so Deuteronomy chapter number 10 and verse 12 and verse number 13. Sister Davida, can you read that for us, please? Amen, amen. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord God, Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Amen. This thought that uh, is, is recorded in, in the Torah scriptures of Deuteronomy is really a thought that has not changed with the New Testament. What does the Lord God require of us? You fear the Lord and live in a way that pleases him. Uh, this reminds us of the New Testament scripture that tells us um, we must, ple- uh, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And that also that it's called us to obey him um, and obey his instructions and love him and serve him with all of your heart and soul. That goes back, remember, to the first and greatest command. What do we all to do? Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so what he's saying here is that Moses was reminding him, look. What is God asking of you? Yeah, it's great if you offer sacrifices. Yeah, it's great if you go to Sunday school. Yeah, it's great if you, you know, open your Bible. Yeah, it's great if you do all those things. But if you do all of those things and at the heart of it, you don't love God and fear God and you don't serve him with all of your heart and soul, then all of those things are wanting. And this is really relevant in this day and age because I believe that there are many people who do religious acts and their hearts are far from God. That's what that's what the New Testament predicted. That's what the Gospels predicted, that there would be people who did not love God or love the things of God, but only loved pleasing themselves and doing what their itching ears wanted to hear. So what are we saying here is that this is a command instruction that we've got to do even in this day and age. The second specific instruction is found in Deuteronomy chapter number 16, And verse number 18, Uh, Brother Obi, can you read that for us, please? The Lord. Um, Deuteronomy 16, 18. Appoint judges and officials for yourselves from each of your tribes in all the towns the Lord God has given you. They must judge the people fairly. You must never twist justice or show partiality. Never accept a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wise and corrupt the decisions of the godly. Let true justice prevail, so you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God has given you. Amen. So let me pause here for a moment, um, um, because I think we can learn a very important contemporary lesson as we pause on this passage here that the Lord gave um, uh, to the people of God in in Deuteronomy. Um, So first we begin to learn what is in God's heart. Because if God shares it or takes the time to speak about it, it's in his heart. And so one of the things that he begins to say and gives instructions to people is that there will be judges and officials for yourself uh, 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 from each of your tribes and all the towns the Lord has given to you. They must judge the people fairly. So the first thing we begin to learn about God is that God expects judgment and righteousness and fair judgment and righteousness. Does that, does that make sense? So, you know, one of the things that is interesting that I always find is that, you know, uh, one of the common, you know, refrains that I hear from some of our uh, uh, more uh, conservative or fundamental brothers and sisters in Christ is, well, just preach the gospel. Just preach, you know, the good news. And, and what I'm beginning to share is that the good news implicates certain behaviors, actions, and realities. And one of the things that we see modeled all the way from the Old Testament is that the good news implicates that we must be those who fight for justice and God cares about true justice. What does he say in verse number 19? You must never twist justice or show partiality. Um, You know... (laughs) 
this right there, when anybody asks, well, is race and racism a gospel issue? Right there, it's God's heart. It is at the heart of what God cares about, where he's told the people, don't twist justice, don't show partiality. That means partiality because of economic status. That means partiality because of, uh, of skin color. That means partiality because of caste system. All of those partialities, God says, stop it. That does not belong to the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, never accept a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wise and, cor and corrupt the decisions of the godly. So he begins to say that even those who desire to do godly things, they are corrupted when bribes and other means come into play. And then finally, I love this here in verse 20, he says, let true justice prevail. Let true justice prevail. Come on, let's say that together this morning. Let true justice prevail. What does that mean? It needs to prevail in every place that we're at. It needs to prevail in everything that we're doing. It needs to prevail in our attitudes. And, and remember what we say when we're fighting kingdom of God versus kingdom of darkness. If we're fighting for the kingdom of God, true justice must prevail. Um, what is interesting here, and we're going to reflect upon these passages of scriptures uh, in a moment, is that a group of inf influential elders gathered together and pro proposed what they thought was an ingenious solution. Um, don't you love when people get together and they come up with wonderful ideas? Um, some of you work in companies where managers come up with wonderful ideas and you look and say, who came up with this idea? Have they ever done the work or the responsibility because they have no idea what they're talking about? Um, I thought about that when the whole wave of, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I call it the Google office buildings. So Google had this whole aspect where um, they had open floor plans. And so they thought to increase productivity, you can't have cubicles anymore. You've got to have an open floor plan, an open space. Now, most of the time, I spend 90% of my time at work talking to clients on the phone or talking with clients. Most of my colleagues do the same thing. So whose bright idea is it to have an open floor plan where everybody is sitting next to each other and there are 30 people talking at once and thinking, that's a wonderful idea. This is going to increase Co collegiality and wonderful things. And so, you know, I, I, I'm always skeptical, to be honest, when, you know, groups of people gather together and come up with great ideas. Not that they can't come up with great ideas, but you need people who understand what is going on and understand what's taking place. So what did they come up with? They had an idea. Let's an appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Now pay attention because the writer wanted us to know that what was motivating them including the, included this motivation that they wanted to be like the other nations. So we see there are a couple of factors that motivated them. The first was Samuel's sons were not godly and the elders feared that they would lead the nation astray when Samuel died. So the first thing that we see is that when the people who are supposed to be in leadership don't lead, it leads people to fear and leads people to try and find a way to do what those who were in leadership were supposed to do. The second thing that, um, they, uh, that uh, uh, was motivating them was that the nation had been through a series of temporary leaders during the period of Judges, and the elders wanted a more permanent ruler. The third thing that uh, motivated them was that they likely imagined that Yahweh was not able to secure their continuing prosperity. That means... Basically, they lost confidence and trust in God. Finally, Israel wanted to be like the other nations and have a king to honor. The powerful nations around Israel were a constant threat, and the elders felt that a king would give greater security. So while many would debate the worthiness of the proposed solution, it is quite clear that the motivation behind the solution violated God's commands. Um, let me ask you before I actually share my thought, why, why, why do you think this, would viol this request for a king would violate God's commands? Or why do you think that that would be something that God was, would be against? You, 
king. Yeah, yeah. He was their king, and by inference of that, they were basically trying to usurp the role that only God should have. Uh, what else? Any other things? Pastor Jim, sorry, I wanted to give a shout out to my friend Kenny. Oh, okay, Kenny. All, yeah. all the way from New York. Hey, Kenny, so, thank you so much thanks. for joining us. <laughs> I sent him the Zoom link, so little did I know he would show up. So. Oh, great, great, great. We're glad to have you today. So <laughs> feel free to oh, join on in. <laughs> yeah, I was actually uh, at school today at the OB China. I was actually going to chime in with a comment on what you said. Part of the problem with why, with why God didn't want to see the Israelites oppressed the king is because now they have a fallible being mm. in place of us mm. that have him who's going to always give them the right step at the right time. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. They, 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 they had looked at, you know, <laughs> this is the classic quintessential what I call the grass is greener on the other side. <laughs> um, and and we, we all, uh, come on, let's be honest. Like, there is no believer who is immune from it we all suffer from it. And, and it feels like, you know, a lot of times when we're in the midst of things, if I only just had this, if I only just got this, if things just only change this way, we always feel that, you know, life would be better. But what we're realizing is that there are some things that we have to go through, but God is working through us in the midst of it. We're going to talk about this, but basically they violated the first and second command that I am the Lord thy God, and thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make any graven images. And so, basically, by asking for a king, they were violating the first and second command. Uh, the next section that we see here is, be careful what you pray for. And so they said, give us a king to lead us. And this displeased Samuel. Um, and so, you know, Samuel was different from Eli in the sense that he at least took the issue before the Lord. And so even though, you know, he was a leader and what we learned from him is even though he um, uh, didn't like what they were saying, the first thing that he did was said, let me go before the Lord. Now, Samuel was smart because when the people said this, it didn't pass the smell test and, and pay attention. I mean, like, you know, every one of our unctions are not always correct, but we owe it to explore those unctions to understand how should I respond to something that is being proposed? Um, so um, it is the principle that we see in the New Testament where the Lord said um, uh, uh, the, the, the Bereans were noble and they were noble because of this. The Bereans received the word with gladness and then went back to the word of God to see if what Paul said was true. So you can receive the word with gladness and still take it before the Lord and say, Lord, is this what I should be doing? Um, and you've heard me say before, just because I'm the pastor, um, don't just take it because I said it. Well, I mean, there are some things, you know, I, I'm going to, as, as your pastor, I'm going to lead you. But, you know, go back to the word of God and see, does it line up against the word of God? Does, does what I'm saying line up with what the Lord has uh, uh, instructed in his word? And so after divine consultation with the Lord, um, Samuel receives an answer. And the answer is interesting, and, and, and we see this here. Um, and actually, um, Anna, can you read um, um, uh, verse number uh, 7 uh, and verse number 8? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. I'm on mute. Yeah. <laughs> and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Okay. So this is key here. Um, first of all, Samuel, Samuel, I mean, Samuel was a human being. And so when they said, give us a king, he saw it as a rejection of himself. You know, they don't want me anymore. I mean, you know, it kind of feels like, you know, someone says, oh, we're bringing in a new executive coach. You know, you're like, wait, I thought I was the team leader. You know, like, why are you bringing in, you know, this executive in here? And and so, you know, Samuel, he, probably his pride was hurt. You know, he was feeling like, how are they going to ask? You know, they don't like me and all the work that I've done. I mean, 
You know, he, he, he could have been like others in the scriptures, like, I'm the only one serving God, and, and these, you know, ratchet people, I've, I've served God for them, and I've prayed for them, I've interceded for them, and now they want to reject me. Um, and, and the Lord kind of like humbles Samuel and says, Samuel, this has nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter who was in this position. It's not you that they've rejected. It's me, God, that they've rejected. And um, what we realize is that, you know, we can acknowledge that earthly systems and organizations are not ungodly. Um, those are principles that God employs us to have. Um, but what God was showing in this time was that there was a darkness that was in the hearts of the people. Um, this is something that we're going to see later on because you remember the story of Saul and David. Uh, when we fast forward to David, you remember what the Lord, uh, uh, excuse me, Samuel said about David, man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. Um, this is true to this day. We can do all the outward things that make us look, I mean, but... You know, even in this season, we can do all the outward things that make us look like we're down with Black Lives Matter. We're, we're fighting for injustice. And, you know, someone uh, someone was sharing to me, like, they, they said, uh, you know, every single company that they bought something for in the last, like, 10 years have, you know, sent out emails. We're down with you. You know, we're, we're fighting for this. And, and you can say all of those marketing words, but what really comes into play is what is in your heart. What is in your heart? So what do I mean by that is that um, we're looking for more than just words that pacify. We're looking for transformed hearts um, because God is working within them. Um, you know, there was a controversy with um, uh, footballer Drew Brees, and I believe he had a true heart transformation after some of his teammates um, who were black sat down and talked with him and said, listen, as a friend, this is why I need to share with you why this was offensive to us and why what you're saying um, is not um, an accurate picture of what is going on and taking place. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm imploring us, there is the importance of the awareness work that is going on globally about the, the times that we are in, but don't negate the personal relationships that we have, and even in our church community, the personal relationships that we have with one another, because that's how we're going to learn from one another. That's how we're going to grow with one another, where we can say, you know what? Uh, you're my brother. You're my sister. Um, let's talk about this. Let's work through this. Let's begin to see how we can make a difference in these things. And it might seem like we're not changing the whole world, but we do it one person at a time. And so as we work together and grow together and love each other, will help grow through that. Um, so what is in your heart? What is in your heart? Um, the, the people use the rationale of installing a king as a good solution to their earthly issues. Um, but the truth was the people had gotten, had gotten tired of God's kingship and were masking their underlying heart corruption. Not only did the Lord reveal the condition of their hearts, but he also reminded Samuel that this that this is the same pattern that the people have been doing for, for years. Um, you know, I, I could imagine if this was a movie scene, you know, it was like, you know, it's basically, you know, Lord saying, y'all ain't no good and you ain't never been good. You know, like, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, it, it, I, I can't say what I want to say, but, you know, it's basically like, you ain't good, your mama ain't good, you, you know, your daddy ain't good. I mean, it, he, he's, he's basically saying, look, their hearts are depraved and this is the same thing that they've done over and over and over again i mean look what he says in verse number eight as they have done from this day i brought them out of egypt until this day forsaking me and serving other gods so they are doing to you so he just said look <laughs> i'm used to this <laughs> this is the same tricks same antics they're rejecting me they're rejecting me but no I'm trying to bring them and draw them back into a right relationship with them. So what does that mean? 
Most people would expect a different answer from the Lord, but in verse 9, the Lord gives them free will. Um, and he says, the Lord tells Samuel, listen to the people, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. So, let me ask this question, because this is an interesting theological question that I have uh, debated vigorously with others. And so, why did the Lord allow Israel to have a king if he knew what it was going to do to them? And do you struggle with the fact that the Lord allowed them to have a king even though it was not his best will? Pastor Joe, um, well, let me let me take a shot at it. I did pick up on the fact that he said he debated it vigorously, <laughs> so I'll try to be a little profound here. <laughs> well, I think I think I think it's in line with what God's true nature is. Like, let's look at the Garden of Eden. He'll still leave the tree there and say you can eat everything, just not that one. So it's in line with who God is, which mm-hmm. is. Um, to, um, I'm setting before you guys life and death. Choose who you're going to serve. I hope you pick life. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yes, absolutely. This in Joshua, giving the people choices. I think at the end, I hope you pick wisely. And I'm uh, sorry, I also thought back, let me try to answer, well, make an attempt at something you asked previously, which was, why was God upset about them asking for Saul? I think it also goes against what God wants, which is to walk by faith, mm-hmm. not by sight. By choosing a physical king, you're trying to walk by sight. Mm-hmm. So, but I think here God answered their request because I think if you look at God's true nature, God isn't trying to force anybody to believe in Him. That's why you still have atheists and they're even prospering and thriving. And so, I think it's in line with God giving people what they really want after letting them know the real fact. Amen. Amen. Good. Good insight. Thank you for that profound wisdom. <laughs> Amen. Others who want to share? I was thinking of this scripture in Psalms where he says, my, my spirit will not always strive with man. Mm, and in mm-hmm. Romans, he says, you know, there's a point where he gives them over to their own desires. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think there's a point where God will uh, lovingly try to, you know, get us to do the right thing. But there's a point where he says, all right, these are the consequences of your actions. Um, similar to what Brother Obi said in Deuteronomy, I'm placing before you a, a choice of life or death. Mm. Choose life. But mm. if you choose death, this is the things that are going to happen. Mm. So ultimately, it's it's it does come down to, I'm going to give you what you want. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Others? Uh, any thoughts? I think it's worth remembering, though, that God still winds up working redemptively through the kings of Israel, like mm-hmm. that Jesus comes from the line of David. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. even when we, you know, I, I think I, I can I can point to things in my life where I've done this, where I have maybe not done what I should have, but mm-hmm. God has worked redemptively through it. Amen, amen, amen. Um, his grace <laughs> that, is, that is given to us, and um, we see it abundantly even when we make wrong turns. What else? Well, as Obi alluded to, it's, it's, uh, this issue of free will. Mm. If you look at the, the, the price that, that God had to pay, or that we have to pay for free will, you know, people do bad things. Mm. Sometimes the bad things affect only them. Sometimes they affect other people. Sometimes they affect everybody. Mm. But it, ultimately, at the end of the day, God decided to give us free will, and it's just consistent with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, is there anybody who thinks God, uh, who maybe would take the opposite position and say maybe it was God's will for them to have a king? Okay, no debaters there. <laughs> um Yes, hold on one okay. second. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so sorry. So sorry. It, it, I, 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 oh, although we're looking at the fact that the king that comes in is Saul, mm-hmm. in the long run, it's David in the line of David and eventually Jesus mm-hmm. um, that 
is going. So it, it didn't take God by surprise. Mm, mm-hmm. um, it was actually ends up being to God's glory in the long run. Mm, amen. Amen. Um, uh, you know, uh, Brother Kevin actually raised a, a good point that um, some commentators have debated in terms of, um, you know, why would God allow the people to have a king? And one of the arguments for, um, you know, basically saying that uh, Samuel took the request before the Lord. Um, so some would say that if it was completely outside of the will of God, Samuel would have never, the Samuel would have never even brought it before the Lord, you know, um, it's, I mean, the, the equivalent is, you know, is Samuel, you know, Samuel would not go before the Lord and say, should I cheat on my wife? You know, like that, that's not something like he'd bring before the Lord and say, uh, Lord, I'm struggling with this. You know? And so that, that's one argument that some make that, um, you know, Maybe this was not completely outside of God's will. What we do see, uh, what is key, is that although some of the earlier scriptures allude um, to uh, uh, basically going from a theocratic to a monocratic um, rule, um, one of the key things about that is timing. And um, one thing that we learned with Abraham, um, we saw, you remember, with Abraham and Sarah, um, and, and they're trying to you know, conceive, and um, they go through Hagar, the handmaid servant, is that we learn that um, God's will in the wrong timing is still outside of God's will. Um, and so what I mean by that is that timing is just as important as to what God is asking us to do. So not only do we need to know what God is asking us to do, but when God is asking us to do it. And so one of the things that um, some commentators Um, uh, uh, would say is that um, ultimately God knew that the people would have a king but the timing for an earthly king was not then Um, but what we do realize is that and we'll see this as we wrap up uh, this chapter here is that at the end of the day the heart of this that displeased God was that their motivation of what was in their heart was make us like all the rest of the other people Make us like all, what is what all the rest of the other people. No matter what, God is looking at our motivation. And that motivation was something that dishonored God because God said, you will be my very own people and I will separate you. And yet they looked at the rest of the people and said, I want to be just like them. Now, I... Uh, well, let me not get ahead to that, and I'll, I'll talk about this at the end as we wrap up. Just a few more verses. So briefly, in the next section, what we see here um, is that um, uh, uh, entitled, You've Been Warned. And so basically, Sam, the Lord tells Samuel what to say. He says, you can have a king, but it will put Israel in a worse earthly condition. And then he outlines several er- uh, things that an earthly king uh, would do. So the earthly king would assume rights, otherwise reserved for the Lord. He would take your sons and uh, make them serve. Um, he would assign uh, some to be commanders of thousands and, and plow the ground. He would take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to the tenants. He will give a tenth of the grain and a vintage office to give it to his officials. And then he says your manservants and maidservants and the best of your cattle and donkey he will take for your own use, for his own use. And then he said he will take a tenth of the flocks. Um, These are all natural consequences that um, uh, Samuel reminded the people of what would happen if they put a king in place. And, you know, those things, you know, you could think about, like, when you do the risk-reward calculation, you can kind of be like, well, you know, like, I mean, some people might say, okay, I can debate that, you know. Well, maybe, you know, I don't care if, you know, all my cattle and donkey is gone as long as I have security. And and people make these risk-rewards all the time. But the, the verse number 18 scared the mess out of me. If I would have heard this, I'm like, nope, not going to do it. This is what the Lord said. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can if you want to. How many of you... Has the Lord ever told you, do not do this because these are going to be the consequences or, or this is what's going to happen. And you said, Lord, I don't care about the consequences. 
I want that. You don't have to raise your hand, but you can. <laughs> um, all of us probably should raise our hand and say, look, there have been plenty of times where the Lord has warned me, don't go down that road. Don't hang out with those people. Don't, don't do those things. This is going to lead you down a path you don't want to be. And still, somehow in your flesh, it tells you, well, I'm not going to be the one who's going to be affected by that. Oh, that's not going to hit me that way. Or, I, you know, we, we somehow find a way to tell ourselves it's not going to be me. Um, and this is what they did. Um, and one of the conclusions is we should never want to be in a position where the Lord says, I told you so, and says, I will not listen to the cries of your heart because you are stubborn. I don't ever want to be in the place where God says, I've let you, I've left you to your own devices. What, what, did, what did David say? He said, um, don't leave me, um, 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 uh, and I want to dwell all the days of my life in your presence, and, and, and don't take your presence away from me, Lord. And what he was enumerating was, don't put yourself in positions where there is a wall of stubbornness between you and God. Now, I know we do it all the time, and the beautiful thing, as Grace reminds us, is that when, when we do <laughs> these things or make these decisions, God's grace is still available to us even when we mess up. But what we don't, what we take for granted is that these mess ups sometimes have earthly consequences. And these mess ups can derail God's will from being done in our life because we were stubborn in getting there. What we see the, the perfect example in the promised land. How many days journey was it to the promised land? Forty. How many, how much time did it take them? Forty years um, to get to the promised land. So um, when we, when we mess up, um, though God's grace is available to us, it can hinder us from receiving God's full will. So as we close out um, uh, this chapter, um, verse number 19, um, very instructive verses 19 through 21. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone get back to his town. Literally, verse number 19 uh, in another translation says, the people refused to obey. Brethren, beloved, don't refuse to obey God's instructions. And what we see here and the reason why we could say about what was going on and why this decision was, even though God redemptively used it, why the timing of it and the heart of it was not in God's will was because their hearts were exposed. At the end of the day, your heart will always be exposed. And so even though you might say the right words, even though you might say uh, the right thing, your heart will be exposed. And what was their heart? Their heart was, we want a king over us. We will be like other nations. The king will lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. Man, you know, anytime you take something which previous scripture says the Lord will do it and replace it with somebody else, you've made an idol out of it. I mean, the Bible tells us that the Lord will fight our battles. And what now what do they say? We want someone who will fight our battles. We want a king who will fight our battles. And the Lord affirms their bad choice and relents to give them a king. What a sad day in the history of Israel. And when it is too late, they will regret their choice. Now, before they get to David, they're going to have to go through Saul. And they're going to realize Saul um, was a narcissist. He was, um, he, um, he, he was insecure in his calling. And because of that, the position and responsibility of leadership overtook him. 
And so uh, there are many contemporary parallels as we're going through 1 Samuel with our current political li- landscape and, and, and what is going on. Um, one thing as I, as I close and, and wrap up today is that you often hear me affirm, um, most of you know that my background is in law. Um, and you know that I'm also a pastor. And I believe in righteousness and holiness. And I believe that these are things that um, without the Bible tells us that without them, no man shall see the Lord. And I absolutely believe in those things. But I don't believe that the solution to those things is legislating morality. Um, Like Israel was, they wanted an earthly king so that they could be like the other nations and that they would have the, the, the joy of a, an earthly representative that would do what they want to do. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't believe any Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever um, um, uh, a leader can fully effectuate the kingdom of God in this earth. Now, what we've got to recognize is that um, Israel was living in a theocracy. Um, America is not a theocracy. As much as we want it to be, Uh, Some want it to be, it is not a theocracy. And so um, the key thing is that um, God is looking at the hearts of mankind. And if we, all we do is legislate, um, and and again, legislation is important, but if we do legislation to the detriment of working towards changing the hearts and the minds of the people, um, we will advance in the earthly systems, but still have it undergirded by hearts and motivations that are far from God. Um, Those are my brief thoughts on um, the current landscape and and kind of what we shared this morning. And uh, uh, that's 1 Samuel chapter number 8. A lot of things to unpack and and kind of go through, but um, thankful for uh, the opportunity for us to kind of look at it and to unpack it a little bit more. Um, For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, Again, welcome. We're glad to have you with us and so glad you could be a part of today's study. Um, One of the things that is our custom at the end of today's service um, is that we just kind of share a thought or a nugget uh, or maybe even a question that kind of um, uh, we got from today's lesson. And so uh, we invite you, um, just as you're thinking about all the different things that we share today, uh, we invite you just to share um, something that you either gained from today's uh, lesson, a thought or a nugget or or something that uh, was important that you'll take away from uh, today's lesson. So, uh, anyone care to start this morning? Sure. Once mm-hmm. again, uh, thanks to Obi for inviting me, and thanks for having me here. Yes, it's absolutely. Been, uh, old Floyd protest. I'm actually writing an article about that if I mm. put out Monday or Tuesday. I'll oh. post the link to my website in the chat, and you guys can look out for it. But oh, I think you. your point about mm-hmm. legislating behavior is a good one because a lot of folks think that by passing a law you can somehow change the hearts and minds of others it's actually the opposite way around people that Mm -hmm. want a change from these protests have to start thinking of the ways that other people are thinking Mm -hmm. and to start presenting plans and ideas that actually speak to them Mm -hmm. half and people like the average middle american doesn't want to hear that you're just racist for existing you got to show them why if you can get the problem Mm -hmm. what they can and most importantly, you got to listen in turn as well, because people don't want to be shouted down and feel as though they're going to be castigated for giving their opinion. Amen, amen, amen. Um, we'll definitely be looking forward to uh, see that article and definitely love to hear, uh, read some of your writings. And, and uh, again, we're glad that you were able to, to join us. And, and the reality of going beyond just a, um, a crowd movement to true transformation. Um, my goal as, as, a, as a follower of Christ is to see people transformed. Um, I can't do the transformation. God does the transformation, but God can use me as a vessel of transformation. And so, um, you know, we realize what the scriptures talked about where, you know, um, when Jesus said hard things, the crowd stopped following him. And, and we want to be more than the crowd. We want to be people who are transformed by the words and the instructions of the Lord. So thank you so much for that. Others? Uh, I guess not just to say me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I was moved by a lot of what you shared. Thank you so much for putting the time and effort into preparing this for us and sharing mm-hmm. wisdom. 
mm. um, and being a vessel for us. Thank you. Um, from the very beginning, when you talked about um, not being on either side, um, but being on the Lord's side, that just struck a note in me that yeah. it just kept reverberating throughout everything else you shared. Yeah. And when I think about um, um, going before the Lord, even when you when um, when He didn't want uh, when they wanted a king, mm. and um, mm. He didn't take a side either. Mm. He took their plea. Even, even though he probably didn't want a king <laughs> to the Lord. And um, I thought that was instructive for me because right now, um, you know, I'm in a, in a different place than some of the other folks that are on this, that are in this service today. Mm, mm. But it's hard not to want to take a side, like what you said about sharing and wanting to get on Facebook and, and you know, say something or rip somebody's heart out. Oh, you didn't say it quite that way. <laughs> I'm going to give you a and sometimes I just want to defend or I want to hurt back. And, um, you know, you feel like you have to take one side to fight back, but you mm. find it's injustice or yeah. not God's will. And um, I think it was really instructive to me in my heart to mm. step back and make sure that I'm just, I'm focused on the Lord mm. and I'm doing what he wants and praying for what his wisdom is mm. and not trying to fight a fight that's in darkness already mm. um, and trying to find wisdom in that and to touch hearts in God's way, not using all the media and whatever. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling, but no. it, that was really instructive to me, so thank you. Amen, amen, amen. I, you know, it, I think the sequence is important because um, if we go strictly to pragmatic solutions, we lose the instructive wisdom of the Lord to understand how do we implement those pragmatic solutions. And so uh, not negating pragmatic solutions, absolutely, I think, you know, whenever I'm here, we need we need pragmatic solutions, but instructive of that is what is the Lord saying, and, and how does that teach us what to do with the pragmatic solution? So, thank you so much, Danny. It's always great to see you, and we love your smiling face and your your family joining us today. So, <laughs> I think one thing that really stuck out to me was um, when we were um, discussing Deuteronomy ten twelve, mm-hmm. um, what it means to really live out. Um, a life um, that emulates what Christ has called us to do and live out our lives for Christ as opposed to um, just kind of running through the motions of religious actions, um, like just physically going to church mm-hmm. or attending church Zoom calls, but actually being very mindful of what our behavior mm-hmm. um, models mm-hmm. because that's what ultimately is really what's going to tra- what's going to um, strike notes and leave impressions on other people because we really are witnesses and even as you mentioned um when you think about carefully about what you write on social media and your drafts and stuff just being very selective and thinking about okay well is this going to be helpful for others um because recently i was also even thinking about in my personal life you know what are things in my heart that god wants to stir up or uproot or renovate Mm. Um, mm-hmm. in this season, especially mm. since we're kind of like in this quiet lull, so mm. it's given me time to also have more time to even just read my Bible and think about um, my own purpose and things that God wants for me and how he, um, he wants me to, I guess, emulate Christ in my own personal life and that sort of thing. So I guess I almost feel like I'm starting to ramble a little bit too, but um, but I think that verse, Deuteronomy 10, 12, really stuck with me. Um, to think about also what are things that I do that could be helpful or that are helpful, maybe things that maybe aren't as helpful. Yeah, that's good. Three questions that I always believe every believer should be constantly asking. What should I stop doing? What should I start doing? And what should I continue doing? Um, These are instructive of inquiring of the Lord so that we may understand um, in every season um, there might be things that the Lord is saying stop. There's things that the Lord is saying uh, uh, start, and there's things that the Lord says continue in. And in that, it gives us instructions on how to live out our lives. So, yeah. You know, if um, if the Israelites wanted to be like other countries, other nations, mm-hmm. it must have been because they perceived those other nations as being better off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's there's probably a lesson on contentment in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and there's probably room for the realization that um, what you see is not all there is. I'll give you an example. 
I was a, a small town lawyer for a time, and one of the things that taught me is that people's lives, what you perceive of people's <laughs> lives, is mostly hidden, mm -hmm. like an iceberg. It's, mm -hmm. it's mostly hidden from view. And you may look at Joe or Mary and think that Joe or Mary has the world by the tail. I can almost assure you they don't. Mm -hmm. I can further <laughs> almost assure you that they have issues or problems that you don't want. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want. Mm -hmm. and, and so when Israel is looking at the Philistines or the Hittites or you know, whoever, mm -hmm. um, there's a tendency to think, well, these people are better off. Well, maybe they are, maybe they're not. Mm. But overriding all of that, I think, is is the, the virtue of content. Yeah. Being yeah. content with what God has given us and what God thinks is best for us right now. Amen. Amen. Um, it, it is the words of the Apostle Paul who says, I've learned to be content in every circumstance, whether I am bounding or abasing. Um, and the scripture that we often quote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is really in reference to learning how to be content in all situations. And so um, what a what a great reminder, um, Brother David, on that. And, and so much of, of, of what we see there was their discontentment and really thinking, you know, Yahweh wasn't doing enough for us. And, you know, we don't have to say it out loud, but we've probably thought in our hearts sometimes, God, you're not doing enough for me right now. Or God, you're not meeting what I... I expected of you um, and um, though we can bring those things to the Lord I think the better solution would have been if they brought it to the Lord and said Lord you know the judges who are in place are corrupt you know Samuel is getting old restore your righteousness um, uh, in the land but instead they you know they their solution was give us a king and uh, um, again although there are positive aspects to it think it really affected um, um, the, 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 the direction that Israel went in. And so, yeah. Others? Um, my, my nugget was basically the same as Brother David's, which is that a big theme in the Old Testament is that God wants us to rely on his providence. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's you only need all these trees, in the garden, you don't need that one. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's gather manna for today, but not for tomorrow, because there will be more manna tomorrow. Um, and whether it's I've made you not to have a king and trust in me to be your king. Mm -hmm. Like, and um, it's a pattern that we see again and again and again in the judges when God, you know, raises up a leader, like you know, in Gideon when he raises up an army to defend Israel, but then he, like, you know, the army gets smaller and smaller and smaller so that they don't forget who's, who brought them victory yeah. in the battle. Um, which is not, you know, not to say not to cry out against injustice or anything like that. We also see prophets doing that. But um, it's a, we're reminded of it frequently mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's good to be reminded again. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a New Testament truth as well, I believe. Um, just um, it, it is, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if we're truly striving for that, there's no room to allow other things or um, other things to become our, our place of reliance. Um, again, reliance on him doesn't mean that we don't do earthly things, um, but it is the heart in the center, Jesus at the center of it all. So. Yeah. Jesus says that um, we know enough that when someone asks us for bread, we wouldn't give them a snake mm. and to trust that God's like that too. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you, Grace. Uh, others? I say that because I struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all do if we're, if we're honest. And so <laughs> we all do. Pastor Joel, um, I think for me, the, way, the one thing that stood out was when the people came to Samuel, mm. he immediately went to inquire of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and I think the lesson for me is like, you know, if it, we're tempted sometimes in situations where we need to make decisions or we're looking for direction to kind of just multi, figure out something on our own. Mm -hmm. um, but the reminder is that we would inquire of the Lord, that he's faithful to yeah. give us direction. He's faithful to um, 
to speak to us yeah. and to position ourselves to hear what he's saying. Yeah. Um, there's a scripture that says that when you go along the way, that you'll hear a voice behind yeah. you yeah, saying, go this way or go that. And it's a step, I'll be using me, I'll, it's a step that I sometimes miss because I feel like, you know, I, I can figure this out, mm -hmm. but to always remember to go back and inquire of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if we position ourselves that he will direct us, yeah. Um, no matter what the situation happens to be. Amen, amen. If I could just make a slight addendum, is that not only go before the Lord to inquire, but keep on going to inquire. And, and I think that's where a lot of believers also struggle because they get one word or instruction and then they're like, all right, I got it. Let me go and, and do this. But most times we know in part and we prophesy in part, meaning that you know God reveals only what we need to know for that moment in that season. And so if we just go along um, with what we're doing and not constantly spend in the presence of the Lord, we'll miss out on the next instruction or the next um, next way to go. And so um, so keep on. So not only go before the Lord, but also keep on going before the Lord. So, yeah. Yeah. Brother Obi, I, I think what one thing I'm thinking about from the from the great sermon. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I do appreciate the the insights you bring in. I like the one about putting my point. <laughs> Got you. So what what I what I was what I'm thinking about is how many things I might be persuaded eternally to do that is that isn't really God's will. Mm -hmm. But maybe because I think there's something about God where He'll see your heart and He knows that it's not about what you say. It's like this person's still gonna do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he might, God might not put it that way, but I'm just kind of looking at myself and mm -hmm. wondering what things did I insist on having or mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. or going that weren't really God's will, but He saw how determined mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. Because yes, yes, indeed, it's easy. To even though we can mention and talk about ideas like free will, sometimes it's easy to forget that we have it. It's mm -hmm. easy to think that everywhere I am and all I have is the Lord's mm -hmm. design. This is the perfect way <laughs> yeah. for me to be. But yeah. it might not be. God God might have made, I'm just guessing, God might have made some concessions due to our stubbornness mm -hmm. and said, no, if you insist on mm -hmm. this, well, that's the one you're going to have. And then later on, we think this is God's perfect design that I'm doing. But mm -hmm. So I guess I just need to be reminded that I do have free will mm -hmm. and I shouldn't and I should try to find out what God wants rather yeah. than think that everything that comes my way is what is perfect for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, the most classic example to show briefly is, um, you know, we do a lot of work in premarital counseling and, um, um, you know, those of us who are married or previously married can understand that, you know, even when you think you found the right one, it may not always be uh, the right one. Um, and Or, you know, there are challenges that you might have to go through. And, and one of the interesting things about that is that, um, you know, one of the examples I say is that, you know, you, you know, you might, you might desire to be married to someone and, you know, it might not be in God's will, or especially the example of a believer marrying an unbeliever. And, you know, can God bless that? Um, yes, he can, but the challenge is the amount of work that has to happen in order to bring the two of you together is uh, very difficult. And so the challenge is that, uh, not that God can't work and bless that, but it's a challenge of the earthly capability for a human being, you know, to be able to deal with the, the, the immense pressures that you experience. And, you know, let alone two married, I mean, two believers, um, you know, there's enough problems there, but, you know, add into the fact that one being a believer and one being a non-believer, um, you can try it if you want to. You can do missionary dating if you want to, but my pastoral advice is um, just don't come to me for counseling after you're having problems and issues um, uh, because I've warned you. Um, but no, um, that's, the, that's the essence of, um, you know, the reality that, um, even in, and, and, and it's this balance, um, this balance that even when we make mistakes to remember God's grace is available. And, and, and that is so amazing. That is so, um, I'm so thankful for God's grace because I think of so many bad decisions that like, I look back at them now and say, what was I thinking? 
Um, and then, but the balance of also knowing that we can't take God's grace for granted. And so just because God gives us his grace doesn't mean that there won't be earthly consequences or earthly challenges that we have to go through or fight through. Um, uh, my, my pastor, uh, the late pastor Reginald Lane of Dunamis Outreach Ministries in Detroit, Michigan, I uh, love him, love Pastor Kelly, um, as they continue on 30 uh, so years of ministry in the Detroit area. Um, uh, he used to say, thank God for the prayers that God answers and thank God for the prayers that God says, heck no, you don't know what you're asking for. Um, and, and some of us have, have had those heck no moments where God says, I know what you're praying for, but I'm not going to give that to you because you don't know what you're asking for. And so um, thank God for both of those answered prayers um, that the Lord gives. So thank you, Brother Obi, for that. <laughs> Others who want to share, and I promise I won't editorialize everybody <laughs> uh, after they speak. <laughs> Good afternoon, Pastor Joe. Thank you all for such a wonderful sermon, mm -hmm. and uh, glory be to God. Amen. Um, Thank you, honey. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say that I thought, you know, your question at the end of your sermon about uh, why did God allow them to, mm -hmm. to have a king was uh, really you know, profound, and as you said, just unpacked a lot, and as you said, you don't want to get to the point where God does not want to help you anymore, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> I agree with you that I was also afraid when I read, I think it was part 18 about... Um, when he said, you know, when you cry out to me, I will not answer. Mm, um, mm. You know, realizing that, you know, the free will theme that I believe a few of us have already brought up. And mm. uh, I mean, God will be with you through some, but, you know, I, I definitely personally know I've been in situations where I'm like, God's not going to have my back. Let <laughs> <laughs> uh, me stay away from that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, whole free will and just, you know, the reminder about, the fact that he is our father and um, mm. yeah. he is watching us and he will even allow us to go down a path that's not for us. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just a testament to just how wonderful he is. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for bringing that up. Well, thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure having you the last couple of weeks. And thank you, uh, Obi, for inviting friends Hi, and family. Obi. <laughs> 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 yeah, good, 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 good. Uh, others uh, who are on the line? You want to share? Most of you are muted right now, so you might have to unmute yourself. So. All right, so let me just do a quick roll call to end, and then we'll see if it, uh, the Browns, any anything you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was just awesome to see the um, God's grace, mm. you know, so I, I, I think in the long run, this is a, a, a depiction of God's grace because mm. although the blatant um, disregard of who he was mm. in choosing a king mm. um, eventually makes it full circle <laughs> and he becomes their king of kings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it was just awesome. In that that vein before mm, mm, is the mm, fact that man chose one way, God allowed mm, him to go that way, but then he brought his arm um, into the story <laughs> to make sure that the right way. God does it again. <laughs> even, even when we, I mean, think think about it. I mean, though God was sending His Son um, to this earth, I mean, ultimately He did not want to be separated from His Son, but. God knew the glory that he would bring out of it. And so God is constantly bringing the glory out of it in tragic situations. Um, mm. And so when I look at, even though, you know, however it came about, whether it was a lab, monkey, wherever it came from, um, God can still get the glory out of this situation and hopefully draw us closer to him out of this. And so, amen. Um, Sister Taja, anything? I'm just I'm just grateful for the word that you shared. It. Amen. Praise God. Today, anything uh, you want to share? Sister uh, Kim. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, all knowing, all <laughs> seeing God, Amen. and um, that He doesn't give us everything we ask for. <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> that that is maturity speaking when you can say hey, thank God that he doesn't give us everything we ask for uh, that, that that's a mature believer <laughs> amen amen so good to always see you and uh, thankful for your wonderful family um, we'll close out sister Carla any last part we'll give you the last word Really? That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to go out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, <laughs> I agree um, with Sister Kim um, that and thank God he does not give us what we ask for all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that I am grateful that, um, you know, in this season of life, we know that reminding being reminded that not all things are of God mm. and that he is always in control. Amen. 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 That's it. Praise God, you got the last word. Well, um, uh, actually, Jesus will have the last word today. So um, as we <laughs> gather together, um, if you have uh, elements that have been prepared um, for today, um, normally when we gather together every week, uh, excuse me, uh, every week on the first Sunday of every month, um, we celebrate and commemorate um, the Lord's Supper. Uh, it is a reminder of a covenant meal uh, that reminds us of the strength uh, that we draw from the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Um, we live in this dual existence, um, and, and I think one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is to know the finished work that God has finished everything yet the reality of the brokenness that is in the world that we still live in. Mm -hmm. um, and it is this dual reality, this dual citizenship that we, we struggle with on a daily basis, but we're reminded that God gives us strength um, to be able to endure, to be able to keep on going, and to be able to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. As we come together on this, the first Sunday of June, um, it is amazing to think that we're only... Um, halfway through 2020. Um, it has seemed like 2020 has been the longest year ever, at least in my lifetime. Um, and there have been so many things that have happened. Um, some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us um, have you know, had to adjust to new patterns and rhythms of life. We obviously as a church community have had to adapt to go into online um, church community. There's so many changes that have happen and take place, but I'm glad that in the midst of all the changes that have taken place, there's one thing that is constant, and that is the love of God, Christ Jesus our Lord, who died for us on the cross and rose again on the third day that we might have everlasting life. Um, every time that we take communion, I'm reminded I need strength. Um, most of you know I, I suffer from chronic kidney disease, and one of the effects of that is um, lose strength um, and um, usually on a daily basis um, my body is weary physically um, but as we take this communion I'm reminded that even when I feel like I've lost the physical strength to be able to do everything that the Lord has called for me to do it is not me who is doing it alone it is God who is fighting my battles it is God who is strengthening me God who is giving me the grace to keep on running this race I'm committed, um, whether I'm limping to the end or crawling to the end, I'm going to keep running the race that the Lord has set out before me. And so I don't want to give up. I don't want to lose heart. And even though it might be difficult at times, I'm reminded that God is with us. And so um, if you have the elements this morning, I want to pray for uh, these elements as we prepare to receive them. Lord, I pray for uh, those who have gathered together today and as we prepare to take the body and the blood. Um, it is a physical reminder of the power and the finished work of the cross of Calvary. 
by his stripes we are healed. We thank you that there will be a day there will be no more sickness, no more death, mm -hmm. no more crime, no more injustice, no more racism, no more divisions, mm -hmm. no more um, devaluing the poor, no more, Lord, uh, narcissism, no more uh, wars and rumors of wars, no more fighting and killing and Lord, all the things that we see that are affecting our world even right now. Lord, there will be no more COVID. There will be no more mm. disease. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more loved ones dying alone by themselves without loved ones around them. Lord, um, thank you that we look forward to a hope that is found in Christ Jesus, that the one who came to this earth and, Lord, took on flesh, who became incarnate with us, God with us, who dwelt amongst us. Lord, you promise that he will come again for his bride, his church. Lord, you're coming back, he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And so, Father, as you iron out the spots and, and, and excuse me, iron out the wrinkles and, and, and blot out the spots, Lord, help us to look more like you. Lord, we realize that we fall short daily, but we thank you for the strength that comes from Emmanuel's God. And so, Father, Bless these elements as we receive them this morning. For Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, after eating, he took the bread, and he, after he broke it, he gave thanks and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat of the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant which is in my blood. As often as you do this, you do proclaim the Lord's return. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, be with us throughout this month of June. Uh, thank you um, for um, the celebration of life um, for many who were born in and June, I think of Pastor Ola, Sister Carla, um, and many other birthdays um, that are upcoming, um, uh, Sister Davida, um, um, and, and others who we get to celebrate at every year of life, and thank you for the strength that you're giving to each and every one of us. We pray that your strength will be with us as we go throughout this month. Um, we look forward to the time where we will be able to gather together again, where we'll be able to hug and and embrace one another but lord until that time comes continue to draw us closer continue to allow us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of god in christ jesus name we do pray amen amen mars hill love you guys i really appreciate you each and every one of you thank you for your insight thank you for your time thank you for your care uh thank you for being a part of today's um uh, uh session and um um we'll pray Lord willing, we'll be able to gather together uh, again, Lord willing, next uh, Sunday. Um, don't forget we have morning prayer during the week. Um, the, the, the ladies um, are meeting together on Friday evenings if you'd like to be a part of the ladies group. Um, and then also if you'd like to uh, give of your tithes and your offering, you can use Venmo or uh, PayPal um, and you can go online to Mars Hill Fellowship uh, uh, slash online dash giving uh, to give, or you can give uh, to, uh, Venmo at Mars Hill Boston. Um, and we thank you for your support where it enables us to help support some of the organizations in the community um, that are, are in the place where the Lord has uh, planted us. The Bible says, um, pray for the priests and the prosperity of the place where the land where I've sent you for uh, its welfare will determine your welfare. And so um, part of why we joined in the uh, Brookline protests, uh, our family uh, yesterday was to represent uh, Marcel Boston, but also to represent our family uh, in the community where the Lord has sent us. And we're believing God that uh, as we pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city where the Lord has sent us, uh, we will see that um, uh, branch out into all the land. And so um, I'll be sending... Uh, uh, the 21 uh, notes um, of how to how to be a friend and how to support um, during the season and uh, please share it with your friends and family members and uh, uh, hopefully it can be an encouragement to you in this season. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. All right.
God bless you. Thank you. Love you, Pastor. Love you, too. Love you too. Thank you. Hi, yeah. Opie. <laughs> <laughs> you know you missed me. All right, <laughs> 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 Brother Kevin, see you now. <laughs> Sister Joanne. Oh, Marcel, say, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yes. 